So my name is Mark. I am going to be talking to you a little bit about this concept of anarchy over agility. One of those uh, kind of eyebrow raising titles there, one to kind of drum up some interest. But it really is a, it's a fascinating space. Uh, and so I want to get into it with you and just kind of help you see that there's more to agility than just what we see today. So just a little bit about me before we get going. Uh, again, my name is Mark Kruth. Uh, I actually come here from the United States. I'm from Michigan. And uh, I'm a partner in a company called Teal Mavericks. Uh, throughout my career, I've been in Agile for about 10 years now. I've been everything from a product owner, a developer, a scrum master, a coach. Most recently, I was leading a team of release train engineers. And uh, a lot of my work uh, has focused on how do we reimagine how we work? How do we take old ways of working and think about new creative evolutionary concepts? And so for me, I've been doing, I do a lot of work in personal coaching. I do a lot of work with uh, training, those sorts of things. All trying to get people to, again, think a little bit differently about how they, uh, how they want to work. So let's, less about me, let's talk about what we're here for. And that's this idea of anarchy. And I always like to start this out with a little exercise to get us all kind of talking about it. And it is that aspect of what is anarchy? Anarchy has a lot of different meanings out there. I think if you ask any one of us, we're probably all gonna have a slightly different kind of idea of what that means. So what I want us to do is I want us to find a partner and I want us to take about three minutes, I'm gonna put a timer up, three minutes, I want you to talk with that person about what the word anarchy means to you. How do you define it? What does it feel like, all right? So pick a partner, I'll put three minutes on the clock, have that conversation. Got about a minute left, keep going. If you haven't switched, make sure you switch. All right, sounds like we're kind of getting to a low, low rumble. It sounds like we've kind of got there. All right, so I, want to, I just have a couple questions for you guys. And just feel free to shout out your answers. So what were some words that came to mind when you think of anarchy? Just shout them out. What was it? Chaos? Freedom? What was it? Ah, what other ones? Ah, there we go, another good one. No rules? No governance. Ah, so I have some. Uh, so now I'm looking for a show of hands. Who here? It sounds like who here kind of thought of chaos. All right. Who here? Who are kind of thought of it as like a negative term? Yeah. Right. So I, I personally, I, I think anarchy gets a lot of flack. It's it, it, it is looked at a lot of times as, an anar as a negative word. And so today I want to actually try to demystify that. I want to actually pull that back and actually look at how we take the word freedom. How do we embrace that? Because that's really the way I kind of feel it plays out. And so we're going to do this today over the next 40 minutes or so by doing three things. First, I want to talk to you guys a little bit about what 
anarchy is like in the development world. And there's this movement called developer or programmer anarchy, however you want to call it. But it talks about how we actually realize this in software development. Next, I want to take us to the next level higher. Not just in software, but how we work in general. And this goes to this term of self-management. And so here I'm going to be telling you guys a lot of great stuff here about developer anarchy, self-management. But what can you do out of this session? And so what I want to make sure is I fill your anarchist toolkit. Give you some tools, some tips, things to have. So we'll share a few things afterwards uh, at the end that you can actually take back tomorrow or on Monday and actually start doing to inside a little anarchy. So before we dive any deeper in, let's level set on that word anarchy. Let's make sure we're all coming out of here with a, a solid definition. So if you look up the word anarchy, this is typically the definition you find. A state of lawlessness or political disorder due to the absence of governmental authority. I just feel anarchy is such, so misunderstood. It's, but that's, what, that's the general definition. The beautiful thing about dictionaries, though, is there are other meanings. And so for me, I'm like, all right, what other things are out there? Two other ones I found. Absence of, or denial of any authority or established order. All right, we're getting there. It's, I feel like it's moving away from this idea of chaos, but more of just how do we move more independently. And then this last one, a utopian society of individuals who enjoy complete freedom without government. I like that one, except for one word. It's that utopian. Utopian indicates this idea that we may never be able to hit that spot, which I don't think is, I don't think is right. So for me, these didn't work really either. What were, for me, I, I kind of looked at anarchy and I came up with my own definition. And this is what I want you to take away when you think of anarchy. Anarchy is order without imposed authority. That's what, that's what anarchy is. It's this idea that we can create our own order without having that order imposed upon us. It's, it's freedom of choice. It's the power to make decisions. It's all about distributed control. That's what, that's what anarchy is. So how on earth does this relate then to software? I think you see where we're going here. So let's go into this first phase that we're heading into, where we're going to talk about this idea of developer and programmer anarchy. So back in the early 2000s, there was a guy by the name of Fred George working in the UK. He's working with a small startup called Forward. There are about 50 people. And uh, Fred was an advocate of, of agile ways of work. He's, he's, a, he's bought into it, drank the Kool-Aid, said, yeah, this is great stuff. And so they, he was helping his team leverage all the best practices, everything we're normally used to, things like user stories and estimation, even technical practices like acceptance tests, patterns, design patterns. He was doing all the great things. There was only one problem, though. As they were going through this, they weren't actually making that much progress. They were doing these things, but they weren't seeing the success they expected. Like, we're still moving slow. We're still not actually able to... to to revolutionize our business. And so Fred did something that a lot of people thought was a little mad at the time, and he said, you know what? I think we should start throwing out some of these things that don't work for us. Let's get rid of the practices that don't make sense, that, don't, that we don't feel enable our, our ability to deliver value. Things like stand-ups, things like estimation. He actually kept pairing. He said, we won't do force pairing, but pairing itself is a great exercise to help us share knowledge. And instead of focusing on practices, he kind of took a, a chapter out of the, the Agile Manifesto, and he says, let's focus on values. What do we value as a team? And so through this, they came up with four values that they wanted to focus on. They wanted to focus on trust with co-location. They, as an organization, were working together, and they said, we have to trust each other, and we have to be there with each other. They wanted to focus on results, not blame. It's not how we got there. It's the fact that we got there to that end result that he wanted, that that team wanted to focus on. They wanted to focus on small, short-lived apps. It's not about creating that elegant design. It's about building something, getting, getting it out there, and then building the next thing that goes on top of that. And finally, this idea of continuous deployment. We can have a great CI/CD pipeline, but if we're not putting software out there in the hands of our clients all the time, we're not, we're not adding value. And so this is what, what Fred and his team has done. And the thing is, is everyone could go and eliminate practices. We could go do that tomorrow. But what Fred and his team did, did two other very monumental things that changed the way they worked that incited this idea of anarchy. So here we have a, a normal team. And the two things, the first thing that he and his team decided to focus on was how do we bring our team closer to our client? 
Now his team, like others, were working with, had like a product owner or someone playing that role. They were going through and they were trying to figure out, all right, cool, product owner, what does the client want? And the product would go find out, come back to the team. And so basically the development team was getting a game of telephone going on. They would hear inadvertently through the PO what the client wanted. And he says, we can't do that anymore. So what they do? And they said, team, you're working directly with your client. There's no more product owner. Product owner, you're part of the team now. You're gonna pick up, you're gonna wear another hat. And the thing is, is with that team and with our client, we set new expectations with that client. We said, client, you've gotta teach the team your domain. It's not as, you can't just give us requirements. We have to understand your world to be able to provide you value. And what this ended up doing for them is it actually built this sense of accountability within the team. That the team was no longer just accountable for getting work done. The team was actually accountable for delivering business value for the client, which is a win-win for both. Now the second thing they did is really what takes the cake. Right now, you've got an organization of 50 people or so. In that organization, you still have some of the traditional roles. You've got a technology manager, a QA manager, these roles that are there to help coordinate. The problem with some of that is that it takes away, again, accountability and responsibility. So they said, you know, we're, uh, we're small enough that this might actually be something to be experiment with. Let's get rid of our technology managers, our QA managers. We're gonna fold that into the team. The team is now gonna wear these hats. So yes, we still have the role of a QA manager, but the hat of the QA manager is worn by several team members and it rotates all the time. And so what this did is it created a team and it didn't just, you know, he didn't just throw the baby out with the bathwater with this. He actually created a team that was indep an independent group of people that really needed no management support. They had little to no overhead from must follow practices Every team member wore several hats, and they were accountable for the progress of the team, and ultimately, they worked directly with their client to deliver value, business value. I don't know about you, but if you ask me, that's a, that's a high-performing team. That's what I want my teams to look like. And so this, this whole high-performing team was the genesis of what came, came known as the developer, programmer, anarchy movement. This is where it started. And so through this, as I started learning about it, I was like, wow, this is pretty fascinating. And, and the coolest part to me is, it's very much Agile Manifesto compliant. I mean, you look at the values and the principles of what we're trying to accomplish, I'd even argue that what they're doing in developer anarchy is actually more true to what we're trying to accomplish in Agile than many of the frameworks out there. So this is great and all, it's a cool way of working, but in the end, it's all about success. Did it work? You bet you it did. So here's some figures for you. So at Ford, they went from having revenues of about $3 million a year to $55 million in about five years' time. Same about group of people, they grew a little bit, but it had to do with how effective and efficient they were. Another really cool fact has to do with how they developed software. At Ford, they were delivering software to production in 2009 every three and a half minutes. Something was going to production. I was like, wow, that's pretty good. Even today's time, that's still pretty good. But I was curious in terms of like, how, what, was the, what were the numbers back then? Was that really good? What was that? The oldest thing I could find was a state of DevOps report from 2014. And at that time, they said 4% of companies worldwide were deploying daily. So if we think about this, 2014, five years after this data came out, we were 4% of companies were doing it. They were doing it already, and they were doing it every three and a half minutes. That's a pretty incredible impact. So Fred went off and he, he says, all right, this is great. We, we saw some really good success here, but could we see this in other places? Is, just a, is this a one-hit uh, one wonder or is this something that we can actually move forward with? And he did. He went out to companies like the Daily Mail and worked on their mail online program, largest uh, online news uh, program in the world. He also worked with a company called Outpace. Uh, they're a customer uh, data-driven company out in California. And he helped bring it in there. And, and he saw success in all these places. And to me, as I looked at it, I was like, I wasn't necessarily surprised because the fact is, developer anarchy is successful because it helps empower people. And, and actually, let me put it this way, in the words of some very famous poets out there, some very wise leaders, help, help, I'm being repressed. That's what people were feeling. Developer anarchy is all about helping pull people away from that feeling of repression. Give them the keys to the car. Help them feel 
and be creative. Help them find ways to organize in a different way. The funny thing is that it's all not that surprising because as we've been working, as we've been developing software, and actually just as developing organizations, we've come to realize that there is uh, a difference between the type of work that we've been doing now versus even 100 years ago. That our work has become highly complex versus uh, are highly uh, versus complex versus highly complicated. And I want to kind of get into a little bit of that distinguishment between those two things. And so to do that, I want to talk about uh, the Kinefin framework. Uh, who here's heard of this? Awesome. See a couple hands. So this is a, a great framework built uh, that was created by Dave Snowden. And it's all about focusing on how we make decisions. Basically, whenever we have to decide something, we ever have to go in and try to figure out what to do, we, we essentially practice it from one of these areas. And so I'm going to walk through it real quick with you just so you have an idea of what we're looking at. So if you start out with a problem and you don't know what you're going to do, you start out in this area of, of kind of uh, disorder. It's in this middle gray zone. You can then look at the problem from four different lenses. You can look at it from a, a simple solution perspective. When you're looking at it from a simple perspective, this is something that has a direct, you know, uh, what's the thing I'm looking at? It's like uh, cause and effect. Basically, if I do this thing, this thing happens on the other side. If you ever call a call center, if you, um, if you, if you ever tried restarting your computer after something went wrong, <laughs> that's a cause and effect. That's something we know works. It's something that we can apply and it's pretty practice. That's what we call that simple kind of best practice. Now, if it's a little bit more complicated, we move up into our complicated realm. This is where there is all, still a cause and effect. It's just simply more, you know, it's, there's simply more steps to get there. Uh, you usually need expert knowledge. I like to think of this as things like um, doctors. Uh, if you go to the doctor and you're sick, you're coughing, you have a fever, all those sorts of things, right off the bat, you might not know what you have, but a doctor's gonna run some tests, they're gonna look at you and it says, all right, based on my expert opinion and everything I've seen, I think you have this. That's an, expert, that's an expert advice. That's something that not everybody can do. Now we get to the fun zone. Complex, it says complexity. This is where we eliminate any aspect of cause and effect. Basically, we can no longer try to predict what's gonna happen because there's simply too many variables out there. Stock market, that's a great example of it. I was watching CNBC last night and they were talking about how Boeing had actually just released their, their stock um, or their quarterly earnings. And everyone was expecting it to go down because of their problems with the 737 MAX. But guess what? Their stock went up. No one would have, everyone said that wasn't going to happen. It just shows the volatility of the stock market. It shows how complex it is. And the final area to think about is this chaotic realm. We don't typically act from this zone much, but when we do, it's from this, practice, this idea that we have to move quickly. It's that ready, fire, aim. You know, We don't have time to think. And so we make a decision in terms of where we want to go, and then we have to then recorrect ourselves into one of the other zones. So I show you this because when we think about software development, software development comes from this complex area. It's this area where we develop software and it can be done in several different ways. And guess what? Uh, if you were here in the last session, you heard it. We're all these, you know, these uh, bags of emotion that are, walk that are walking around and we have different ways of thinking about things. And when we do, we fall into this complex realm. I can't predict what's gonna happen. And so when we're thinking about this in terms of, of the manager role, the manager role in an organization originally brought in was there to help provide expert opinion. If I was manufacturing something, I would have a manager who knows what they're doing and they would actually show me how to do it. But if we're working from a complex realm, we no longer need this kind of expert role. We need someone who's gonna help us grow. And so for, for Fred and his team, they looked at this and they said, well, why not just distribute that accountability across the team if we don't need the one expert? And that's exactly what Developer Anarchy went to do. So that kind of gives you an idea of what Developer Anarchy is all about. I wanted to make sure you just had an idea of where this kind of originates in software and what that looks like in terms of an anarchist movement. So now let's take another step back. Um, so one interesting thing is the idea of Developer Anarchy isn't new. It's been around and many of us have heard of it. It's basically called self-management or self-organization. Have you guys heard of those terms? Awesome. So this is this idea that how we, how we work in our destiny is kind of up to us. 
And for me, the, the one area I look at for the, the most for like inspiration here and really like a, a, to me a, a good idea of what self-management is, is from Frederick Leloux's book, Reinventing Organizations. Uh, don't do a lot of book plugs, but one thing I'll say is if you're really interested in this topic, Reinventing Organizations is an excellent book to get you into this. And so Lelou talks about self-management as a system based on peer relationships without the need for either hierarchy or consensus. That's pretty cool. It's basically knowing exactly what you're responsible for and having the freedom to meet those expectations on your own terms. Kind of sounds a little bit of like anarchy to me. Now, it kind of seems like a radical concept, but the funny thing is we practice this concept of self-management every day. Let's think about it. This morning, we all figured out what we we're gonna eat. We made that decision ourselves. We all figured out what we were gonna wear. Maybe someone contributed to that, saying, yeah, you shouldn't wear that. Uh, but we, we ultimately, it was our choice. And then for us, we all determined what we wanted to do. We all determined that we wanted to be here today to try to learn new concepts. Those are all aspects of self-management. Now, the interesting thing that plays out here is you may say, well, Mark, yeah, I understand that we all do self-management, but you know, figuring out how to drive a one million, a multi-million dollar company is a lot different than picking out what cereal you're gonna eat in the morning. And, uh, and I, I'd argue that you're right. The thing is, it's much more complex. So as we think about that complexity, we know we have to find ways to sense and adapt, and we can't just simply apply a framework. And so when we think about self-management, there are a couple models out there I just want to introduce you to so you kind of understand how some organizations are starting to approach this idea of self-management. And the two of the best known ones out there today are sociocracy and holacracy. So I just want to give you a quick overview of what these two represent, uh, how like some of their uh, similarities as well as some of their differences. So just to give you an idea of kind of where they've come from, sociocracy is something that's been around since the... Uh, the mid 1800s, uh, but it really didn't get popularity until the 1980s when an individual by the name of Gerard Edinburgh actually brought it into his organization, uh, Edinburgh Electronics, actually implemented sociocracy. Uh, whereas holacracy, on the other hand, has been something that's been inspired through sociocracy, but it's something in and of itself completely different. It was created by an individual by the name of Brian Robertson. He was a software engineer and he was very much focused on how do I how do I upgrade the operating system of an organization? He, we couldn't just patch on things anymore. We needed to truly change the way we were, we were working. And so he brought about holacracy. Holacracy is something that's a little bit more mainstream right now. It's been something that's been adopted by a lot of co big companies. Zappos, the online shoe retailer, leverages holacracy. Medium was a past user of holacracy. And then even holacracy one, the company that organizes around this, practices what they preach. So let's talk a little bit about some of the similarities here. The three main areas would be around governance, decision-making, and team structure, I want you to know. So when we think about this, both of these or types of models have an organization essentially connect itself through a constitution and explicit roles. There's no management here. There's no one person who's gonna tell me what to do. What I've done is I've actually gone and I've worked in an organization, uh, uh, or what they, people do is they actually have a, like, literally will have a document that calls out what it is that our company is here for and what is everyone's roles. We use that as our governing body. It's no longer a person, it's a document. In terms of decision making, it is collective decision making now. We can make decisions on our own, but for certain decisions, we need to have a generative consent based decision making process. Essentially where we're gonna go through the process of understanding what the problem is, talking about it and making sure that we give consent to proceed or, or not to proceed. And then finally, each of these organ, types of structures uh, advocate for this idea of a small connected teams. And they call them circles in both cases. And these teams are connected in that they, they have basically team members that move between teams to essentially make sure that there's no one team that makes a decision that impacts the rest of the organization in a negative way. So these are, some, these are just some high level items and where they're similar, but I wanna share, I think the most important part is where they're different. And so where sociocracy and holacracy differ from each other has to do with two main areas. It has to do with their purpose and it has to do with how they handle their people. So when we think about purpose, sociocracy is all about its people. Their goal is to find ways of how do we best enable people to solve problems. And the problems that we have as an organization 
uh, are going to be ones that our people bring up. Maybe we're a manufacturer of plastics today, but our people want us to move in the area to build uh, cars. Well, if our people want to move that direction, we will as a company. Holacracy, on the other hand, is a little different. Holacracy has a, a purpose within the organization, and it's an independent thing. It's almost as though the organization is its own entity. It has its own purpose, and it's enabled through the use of its people. It focuses on that unique purpose by leveraging its people. Now, when we think about people and how they play out, of course, with sociocracy, people come first, and people must bring their full selves to work. This means that our organization can't survive without the people that we have. Holacracy on, the, on that same side also agrees we have to enable our people. But the thing is, and it, and it sounds kind of dark, but it's, it, it's not, is holacracy looks at their people as kind of a means to an end. In order to accomplish their purpose, they have to have their people. And they realize that instead of telling people what to do, people are much more likely to help us accomplish the purpose of the organization if we get out of their way and let them, do, let them figure it out. So these are great methods out there. But the problem is, there's one thing, and it's one word that we talked about. It has to do with complexity. Both sociocracy and holacracy are amazing methods, but what they do is they also prescribe a set of things that you need to do this. And what we've learned is that in software development, hell, in organizational design, again, we are, we are working with people who are unpredictable, and each context is going to be different. Problems we solve one way won't be the same in the other. Interesting fact, Medium actually left holacracy if, uh, back in 2016 after four years of leveraging it because they realized that what they were doing was no longer compatible with what holacracy was telling them to do. I actually suspect something similar will happen with Zappos here in the upcoming years because it's something I found online. And, and I kid you not, this is what it says online on the, on the Zappos website about why they adopted Holacracy. They stated that it's the one and only pre-built, out-of-the-box option that any organization can implement for Holacracy. So let me be super clear on this one. There is never going to be an out-of-the-box, pre-built solution to implement Holacracy in your organization. This is simply, the problem is simply too complex. We have to be able to sense and adapt as we go. Now you might be wondering, all right, that's not something. What, could, what can we use? Well, there's one method I, I really, it's, and it's not even a framework. It's more of a set of ideals that I've really resonated with and I want you to know about. It's called Bossa Nova. So you can get to this by looking up online, Agile Bossa Nova. And it's basically, it's a connection of many different ideas. It's actually a melting pot of, Implement, uh, beyond budgeting, open space, sociocracy, agile. And it's basically saying we want to take all these aspects and bring them together and focus on the values that they bring versus the practices they do. Values like cross-functionality, uh, retrospecting and adapting as we go, uh, decision-making, double linking is this idea of having interchangeable circles, like people who go between. And so for me, Bossa Nova is a really good technique to help kind of focus on some of the values that we're trying to accomplish, not that it's the practices we're doing. Now, in regards to organizations, there's been some very successful ones that have focused on self-management. And I just want to kind of go over a couple with you. So first, we've got Valve Software. They're out of the US, and they're, uh, they're a video game maker. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, as Valve, what they do is they have actually are an organization about 400 people. And there's no bosses. They they started out this way, very intentional. And what they what they do is every day they figure out what do we want to work on, and each person proposes an idea. And if that's a good idea, more people will come to it. And they found that essentially, if they wanted just predictability, hierarchy works. But they want creativity, and hierarchy actually hinders that. You've got uh, Morningstar Tomatoes. They're a uh, company out of California, and uh, they range anywhere during the year from 400 to 2,400 employees based on seasonal workers. And the cool thing about them is they, they truly do enable everyone to do everything from make decisions to purchase things, everything, regardless of your seasonal or not. Each, uh, or, each person in that organization creates a what they call a colleague letter of understanding each year, basically stating what, do you, what should you expect out of me as your colleague. And this is their, one of their ways they hold a contract with each other. You've got Bertzorg. Bertzorg's from the Netherlands. You may have heard of them. They're a nursing organization, a home nursing. And they actually started out as a hierarchy. And they had about 7,000 people, and they realized they weren't giving good care. 
And so he says, you know what? Let's distribute it out. We're going to let small independent networks of nurses work together, and they're going to help uh, focus on individual client care. We'll keep a small home office that they don't report to, but we provide coaching for them. And the cool thing is, is Ernst & Young has actually found that patients that go through Virtsorg actually require 40% less care because it's more close, more connected. And then finally, Medium, and, and I talked about them earlier. Medium was a company that levers Holacracy and left it, but it still actually has a happy ending. They realized after leaving Holacracy that the idea of self-management was still really important to them. And so they've actually worked on establishing their own set of principles and values around self-management that's something that they can use then to actually focus in on their own journey. So the cool thing here is that out of all these aspects, what you see is not any a framework or anything like that, but it's a pure concept of intentional inspecting and adapt because they all realize that they're dealing with a complex world. So at this point, we've gone through talking a little bit about developer anarchy, talked about this idea of complexity and how that plays into self-management. I don't want you guys to leave here today without things that you can actually do to think about anarchy and how you can implement it in the workplace. Because a lot of times, you're gonna come out of, like most of the time when I go to conferences, I come back from the conference, I go back and I talk to my boss, I'm like, oh my gosh, I've got all these great ideas, and I get this kind of look from them. Well, that's great and all. And so for me, it's, yes, I can put this big idea out there for him, but it may not latch on, especially if we're talking about, hey, you know what would be really great if you didn't have a job, do, do your job anymore and you were actually one of the team members. So I kind of like being a manager. And so for me, that's, that's what we're trying, to, uh, we're trying to figure out. And through change management, those sorts of things, we have to apply small changes along the way. So what I'm gonna give you is I'm gonna give you seven techniques that I've used, either directly or indirectly, to help spread a little anarchy. They're not major things. They're not gonna push the, the, the apple cart over. But what they're gonna do is they're gonna show you some, uh, some cool ways of essentially starting to breed a little bit more autonomy, a little bit more purpose-driven work. And so I'm gonna go through these pretty quick because I'm running out of time, I know. But one thing to note is that at the bottom right hand, or bottom corner of each one, there's gonna be a link there. And I'm gonna share this deck out, and that link will give you more information on the technique. It goes to an, an article on it. So let's roll through these. Well, the first things I always love to do are team agreements or constitutions. Uh, these are just a great technique to be able to go through and help set expectations with each other. I put it, they eliminate the noise by making the implicit explicit. Even things like how we want to work together, what time we should all be in the office. Um, they prevent these breakdowns in communication. That's the biggest thing you'll find out here is that communication is the linchpin for everything. So whatever you can do to break those down, do that. And it just promotes that self-management thinking because now this is us. It's not a manager saying this is what you need to do, it's we. One of my favorite new tools I've gotten exposed to is this idea of a collaboration contract. It's kind of like a racy, but also a racy mixed with delegation poker that's, made, that's from the management 3.0 world. And basically you do is you figure out what decisions need to be made in the organization. It's a really good way to help distribute that decision making. As you go through, you actually list out, and here's an actual board I use, you list out the decisions, which are the yellow cards, and then you have a couple different columns. You have a column that says, I want to be an, exp I want to be an explain role, meaning that I'm going to make the sole decision, but I'm going to tell you what to do. Uh, well, you, you can give me, I'm, I'm going to tell you what decision I made. Or you can be a consultant, which says, I, I, want to tell, I want to make the decision, but I need to consult others. And it's just a very explicit way to go through and acknowledge where everyone wants to be. Because if you've got a couple people who want to make the decision, we may have to agree that this is an agreed on decision. It can't be one person. And again, it avoids this idea that management needs to make all the decisions. It allows the team to do it. So my biggest encouragement for you here is if you do this, bring your manager into the room. Have that conversation so that everyone's on the same page on decisions. Self-selection is a kind of a radical idea, but if you can get your organization to do it, it'd be pretty cool. Uh, I've seen this done in a couple groups, and, and it's basically having teams figure out what teams they want to be on. It's going through and saying, <clears throat> instead of assigning people to teams, it's actually having t like the teams open and say, hey, what team would you want to jo excuse me, join for the next six months? What do you want to do? Uh, it usually occurs on a cadence every six months or so. 
and uh, it's supported by a formal event. Uh, I know organizations, Microsoft actually does this, parts of Microsoft will do this, where they've got about 30 teams they need to populate, so everyone gets together for a half day, and they go and they figure out what teams they want to be on, and the cool thing is they naturally work themselves out. If all of a sudden this one team's getting pulled, someone says, you know what, I don't mind supporting this other team, and, and things like support organizations, which you think no one would want to go to, they actually fill up. And it's because we've given the teams the ability and the autonomy to kind of figure out where that organization goes. Uh, replacing titles with skill matrix. So another kind of concept out of Management 3.0, but it's this idea that with job titles come this idea of a box. It says, well, no, I only do this. I'm a Java developer. I'm not, I don't do database stuff. That's not my role. If you focus on what skills you need versus what role titles you need, you're gonna find that you're able to, one, distribute the work a little bit differently in your team. Because maybe someone does, maybe it's like, hey, you know, I'm not an expert in this, but I, I could start growing. Well, cool, acknowledge that you're, you're a, a beginner here. And it basically allows us to say, hey, maybe I'm an apprentice, or I'm a journeyman, or I'm a master, and, it, and kind of identify where do we need to be? What, where's our gaps? And so you can start focusing on individual growth versus, and in in what the needs are from the team versus individual roles. Super simple thing you could literally do tomorrow. It's this idea of check-ins. Check-ins are a great way to kind of ground people, help them understand and kind of leave their baggage behind. Because what you do in a check-in is basically you go into a meeting and you, you, you have everyone answer a question. Maybe it's what weather pattern are you today? And it really helps to just to help everyone just be intentional about where they're at right now. What are, what's going on with them? Because what, what you might find is that, hey, someone comes in and is like, ah, I'm having kind of a stormy day. You realize, all right, I, can, I understand that maybe you're, you're not fully with us today. And so by doing this, maybe you're able to put that to the side. It also really helps to humanize everybody. If I hear my senior vice president say, hey, you know, I'm a big old uh, rainbow today. It's like, awesome. It's like, cool, you're in on this. You're, you're human just like me. So Anarchy Days, this was actually inspired out of developer anarchy, and this is a cool idea that came out of a part of eBay. So basically, it's like a hackathon or a ship it day that like Atlassian does, but it's a little different. Uh, each, at a certain time frame, people will still do these hackathons, but instead of just going out there and working on whatever the cool new crazy thing is, it's, you basically get a day of autonomy. You go forward and you work on whatever you want as a developer. The only thing you gotta do is tell us what you did the next day at stand-up. And what this teaches your, our teams to do is about owning their work. It's about making sure that, it's, uh, that you can play the role of product manager like, or product owner. Like, what would you do in this situation? And that's, where, that's the important part, is a lot of times we don't think people can, but this gives them the ability to try that. It gives them the ability to flex that muscle. And I always say, start out, maybe do this quarterly. And then if it goes well, do it monthly. Maybe then do it every two weeks. And you can see where I'm going with this. Find ways to give people more and more chances to do that. And the last thing I want to share with you guys here is this idea of invitation-driven meetings. Uh, so uh, Daniel Mezek actually put out a book called uh, Inviting Leadership earlier this year. Really good book about how do we invite people to conversations versus telling them to be there. And so basically this is something you could, again, do tomorrow or Monday, is when you send out a meeting invite, don't just expect people to show up. Treat it like an invite. Like, be say this is what's in it for you this is why and guess what if they don't show up it's on you not them figure out how do i make this invite more appealing how do i make sure the importance is there treat it like a game have clear have a clear goal label out what the rules are for for the meeting label out how you're going to make sure you get there and then you know give people that ability to opt out um, i've actually got templates here if you're curious to learn more about that we usually do an exercise but i don't have time but you can grab a template here that gives you some tips tips and techniques on how to do this in an effective way that'll help your organization. So uh, we're gonna skip that. So I've already got the Oscar music going. Uh, they've given me my timeline. So I just wanna give you one final thing here and it's a cautionary tale on self-management. And it comes from an organization many of us know and it's GitHub. So when GitHub started, they were a leaderless organization. They had about 80 people and they were, they were making a lot of progress and they were growing really fast. And over the few years, they grew to about 600 people. And as they grew, they realized they weren't communicating well, and they weren't doing a lot, they were slowing down. And so they started introducing leadership. They says, all right, we'll start putting managers in place, and they'll help us. And, and today, you look at them, and they won't look like any, they'll look like any other organization. 
And the problem that it came down to was this idea of intent. They didn't intend to say, we want to drive decisions from the team. They just said, hey, this is a cool thing, we're going to do it. But they didn't maintain that intent. So as we kind of leave today, I want you to think about just those couple things. It's this idea that anarchy is this order without imposed authority. Remember that definition, that that's what I want you to know about anarchy. And that today's problems are complex. We have to deal with them through a sense and adapt. There's no longer best practices we can apply. Deliberate decision making can really create autonomy. It helps speed things up. Consent enables rapid feedback. So if we focus on consent versus consensus, we're able to move a lot faster. And then intentional structures provide longevity. It goes back to your GitHub. And then context is everything. It's just like a, applying any of these practices. It's just like an organ transplant. Your body might need it, but if you don't approach it in the right way, it's gonna reject that thing it needs. So that's all I've had. Just remember that as you go out there, Agile is going to build high-performing teams, but actually Anarchy is going to build high-performing individuals. So that's all I got. What kind of questions do we have? I think we got a couple out there. Very nice presentation. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, however, how would you start the transformation Propose the idea of anarchy development. All of management has to be on board with it. It's quite a big risk. It is. Uh, one of the things you'll find, too, is that in order to get full anarchy in place, uh, and really just self-management itself, you honestly can't do that. It's bleak. You can't do that without the buy-in from things, someone, someone like your CEO or your board of directors. It's one of these concepts where you, I've seen it pop up in small groups, but as soon as a leadership change happens, it moves away, it, get, it dis dissipates. There's a guy I know that worked at Google for a while and he had um, holacracy in place running for a couple of years. He had a new senior manager and the senior manager wasn't on board in it anymore. And so that's where it is hard. And so the best way I have to, to say, start moving yourself in that direction, taking some of those tips, trying to inject that in where you can, knowing that it's a much deeper and longer conversation to get there as you move forward with larger scale. All right, cool, any other questions? Oh, how can this fit into big financial corporations? That's an interesting question. One of the things I think it's going to play out is being very uh, that actually benefits financial corporations is that a lot of times we look at it as like, well, we need single like decision makers, those sorts of things. The thing that things like holacracy and sociocracy bring that a lot of actual organizations, even financial ones, very structured ones don't, is a lot of intention. They don't show, like in holacracy and sociocracy, they actually, again, call out in like a constitution, this is how we operate. It's, uh, f there's a difference between freedom, like in video games, the idea is like you want rules. Rules aren't the thing that hold you back, it's, the, it's, it's imposing rules. And so rules in our constitution say this is how we operate, awesome. We know what we need to do to make sure we satisfy regulations, those sorts of things. Again, not an easy thing, but the goal is to make it explicit, which I don't think a lot of other organizations actually do. All right, next one. Here we got time. One more? Yes, one more. Wait for it. Wait for it. Oh, there we go. All right, what are prerequisites for self-selection exercise? We've tried self-selection for the teams to let people organize themselves around the topic. They like, they, that did not work. So this is interesting. The best way I've seen self-selection work is, you, again, goes back to intentional. Uh, beforehand, there's a lot of pre-work that goes into making sure that you have like a, rep like a product owner. Like for me, every, team I've, every time I've seen a self-selection process happen, each of the teams has somebody who is that, that product owner for that team. And their goal is to provide as much context as possible there. There are also concepts like pick the top three teams you want and then understand where you want to go. So having people become intentional about where they want to go and then seeing what plays out. If you haven't read that book uh, on self-selection, I highly, I'd highly recommend that. They give you some good techniques for that. Um, but again, it all goes back down to you don't want to just say, hey, next week we're going to do self-selection. Now what we got to do is we actually have to think about this and make it a deliberate process. So.